Hello, I'm Dr. Joel Rush. I'm a pediatric gastroenterologist and the director of pediatric gastroenterology for the Goria Children's Hospital at Atlantic Health in Morristown, New Jersey, where I also serve as the vice chairman for clinical development and research affairs in the Department of Pediatrics. I also serve as a professor of pediatrics at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, and it is my pleasure and privilege today to provide you with an update on COVID-19 and specifically how it impacts pediatric inflammatory bowel disease. These are my disclosures, the most uh, germane being that I am on the National Board of Trustees for the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation and um, very happy that they are sponsoring the talk today. My objectives in reaching out to you today is to talk about healthcare guidance for those affected by pediatric inflammatory bowel disease. We're also going to touch on MISC, which a lot of you have probably heard about, pediatric multi-system inflammatory syndrome. We're gonna talk about reopening and, and being in school and, and what it means to be in the fall of 2021 during this pandemic. Hard to believe that we are yet in another year of COVID and, and what does it mean for our children, adolescents and their families who are affected by inflammatory bowel disease. And we're, we're also gonna to touch on the question about a third jab, the third vaccine dose for COVID-19. Um, Probably the best data, and this is a website that's available to everyone. I downloaded this information early last month. Secure IBD is a worldwide study um, where all gastroenterologists are encouraged to enroll their patients who have inflammatory bowel disease and contract COVID-19. And we've really been learning a wealth of, of knowledge um, from this data base and mining the data and learning more and more. Um, as of September 8th, there were almost 6,600 COVID positive inflammatory bowel disease patients enrolled in Secure IBD from around the world. 741 of them were below age 20, and I focus on them as the pediatric population in this study. Happily, no patients under 20 had succumbed to COVID-19 in the Secure IBD database, and only seven required ICU admission. Looking at the Secure IBD beta database as a whole, what we learn are the main risk factors are older age, and I'm not gonna put a name or number on that, we'll just name it as older age, active disease, active steroid use, and other medical comorbidities, obesity, diabetes, heart disease, et cetera. So those are the main indicators for a bad outcome with COVID-19. And, and, and we can see how a lot of those would not apply to the majority of our pediatric IBD population. So what guidance can we provide to our pediatric patients and their families as we enter fall 2021 and the current school year? Um, first, I want to talk about the spectrum of disease. Um, fortunately, as we just saw from Secure IBD, the majority of pediatric patients do well, but there is a small subset who develop severe symptoms. The most common symptoms of COVID-19 are fever, shortness of breath, and cough, and I think we've all come to recognize that. What's also been recognized and may not be as common knowledge is that common gastrointestinal symptoms such as diarrhea, nausea, or vomiting, or even belly pain can be seen with COVID-19. And of course, this can be quite confusing for those who already have inflammatory bowel disease. So a new onset or worsening of symptoms, especially in the presence of fever or cough, should at least have um, the question raised, could this be COVID-19? A very telltale symptom of COVID-19 is the sudden loss of taste or smell. Now, there certainly are other um, viruses, for instance, other infections, other causes to have sudden loss of taste and smell. But during the pandemic, anyone who has such a symptom should think of themselves as having COVID-19 until proven otherwise. So what's the take home message? If your child comes to you with new onset symptoms, even if they are abdominal in nature, um, especially if you know that there may be an exposure, think about COVID-19 and the possibility of it. And it might be time if you have ready access to testing to obtain a COVID-19 test or to see your primary care clinician either through a virtual visit, which they may prefer in such a setting or in the office setting if that's possible and try to get to the bottom of, of uh, the root causes of these symptoms. As I said, 
most children are mild and that's the good news. The flip side of that coin is we recognize that children really may be um, a ready reservoir. So if I'm asymptomatic, I don't know to quarantine. I don't know that I might put you at risk. And so that's why the asymptomatic child like in the school setting um, may be a way of this virus spreading. Um, it really may be that within the next couple of days, if not weeks, um, the vaccine will be approved down to age five. And I think that will be a great breakthrough in being able to immunize school age children, both for their own safety, but also to stem the tide of the pandemic. Until that time, what should we be doing with our patients who have inflammatory bowel disease? Well, it's in bold, so we don't miss it. We've come to recognize that if you are on medications, stay on your medications. Even during the pandemic, a child whose inflammatory bowel disease goes out of control and then develops COVID-19 is the child that we worry about the most. If your child develops fever, if you're worried that they have COVID-19, by all means, contact your IBD care team for further advice. But the general mantra is stay on medications. <clears throat> Certainly for our children who are receiving nutritional support for their inflammatory bowel disease, there's no reason to change diet during the pandemic. Let's talk a minute just about MISC so that you recognize these um, concerning symptoms. So if you're thinking, could your child have MISC, that's because your child is ill. This is a high fever, high inflammatory syndrome that can lead to shock and low blood pressure and really may require intensive care. So if your child develops difficulty breathing, chest pain, is unusually lethargic or has altered mental status, any of these should be a reason to call 911. There are um, some interesting specific uh, symptoms with MISC, including swollen glands and lips. And so that in the presence of fever or cough should really raise concern about this syndrome developing. Fortunately, as the numbers are going down, we are seeing even less of this rare, severe manifestation of COVID-19, but unfortunately it has not gone away. So it's worth keeping this possibility in mind. Let's talk about the more common um, questions that come up in the pediatric age group. It's time to go back to school. It's time to return to daily life. Many of our children already have. And what's the guidance for this type of activity? So let's remember, why do we want our children to go to school in the first place? Well, school attendance fosters social development. So while we've all gotten very comfortable with Zoom and being virtual as we are right now, it's not the same as being in class and being in person and being with their peers. And so that's why the push to go back to school. It gives a sense of structure to a child's day. And we're gonna talk about structure again. It's very important for children. Quite frankly, it's very important for all of us, right? At the beginning of the pandemic, we were all told most importantly, get up and get dressed. Don't spend the whole day in your pajamas. We all deal very well with routine and with structure in our lives. And certainly school is a very important part of that for our children and adolescents. But the goal is to be able to normalize, to go back and have this social structure as safely as possible. And that's why, the American Academy of Pediatrics has issued guidance for schools, which emphasizes the importance of mask wearing. We already reviewed how children can be asymptomatic carriers of this virus and by mask wearing, quite frankly, not only have we seen a drop of COVID, we've also seen a drop of influenza or regular flu, the common cold, et cetera. So I think the pandemic has taught us a lot about the importance of hand washing, good hygiene, mask wearing and social distancing and how these simple measures can, can cut the spread of not just COVID, but of any respiratory virus. In addition to telling children you need to wear a mask, it's really incumbent upon the school to have an all encompassing approach for the mental health support of the children and, and families. And so we're really um, impressed by the amount of parent school interactions that we've seen in our own area, and probably you've seen the same. And by working together with the schools, we can best get the best quality of life and educational outcomes for our children. The schools will need to be adaptive. 
If the rates of COVID go up, they may have to go back to virtual. Certainly, we all trying very hard not to do that. And thankfully, with the falling rates in light of vaccination, this really may not be necessary. Um, having readily available testing, and now there's even in-home testing with fair reliability. And so having testing available allows those with questionable symptoms to test and quarantine if, if positive and not bring the virus back to school. And so they really, it's a team, it, you know, to, to use that overused phrase, it takes a village, but it really does. It's, it's our um, state and local officials, along with the um, school board and the parents working together to really making a safe, supportive um, structure for our children to be back in school. What else can we do besides just masking up? So we are really emphasizing the importance of vaccination for all children 12 and up. And as I said, very soon, hopefully we'll see um, the Pfizer vaccine and, and not far behind Moderna will start having um, indications, not just 12 and up, but five to 12. In addition to the children, the full staff need to be vaccinated. Of course, there needs to be social distancing in school and, and there needs to be a real plan, especially during um, times such as mealtime and lunch where everyone's gonna be in one area and need to unmask because of um, um, just the fact that they're eating. Our friends in the Southern climates are gonna have an easier time than those in the Northern climates. When it's warm out, certainly utilizing outdoor eating areas will be really advantageous. Um, an important thing for our younger children, um, I, I've been impressed by how much the children are actually enjoying walking around masks. I have to be honest, still every time I pull up to a store and I put my mask on, I feel like a bank robber, but I think they're enjoying that, that part of life. Um, and, um, but they still need unmasked time. They need time when they can see adults. And if that can be worked out with the schools, that they actually get to see their teacher unmasked at some point, that has been shown to be very helpful. And of course, at home and in safe pods, unmasking can be supported and probably very helpful. Some um, important strategies for, for parents in talking to their children. Um, let them understand why there's a mask mandate and why it's important to be socially distanced. The more children understand and it, at an age appropriate level, but the more they understand why we are asking something of them, the more likely they are to comply with being asked something of them. And we can make it fun at age appropriate levels, right? I mean, should we put superheroes on their masks? I, I, you know, just seeing children in the office, I have been just blown away by the variety of masks and the creativity of masks, different materials and different um, 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 costumes and different pictures drawn on the masks, et cetera. It's really become a, a way of um, personalizing your, your wardrobe, if you will. And, and kids really seem to be embracing this. We talked the importance about schedule and the same thing. If, if things are a little topsy-turvy, a little different at school because of social distancing, et cetera, it's very important that when they get home, routine and schedule is maintained. So any way we can make consistency in an inconsistent world, the better. I, I will say, and again, another observation is that our children seem to be much more adaptive than adults, and they've adopted to our current state in a lot of ways even better than adults, but not all the time. And so be on the lookout for that child who maybe is having a little tough time with these changes and whatever you can do to stabilize and make their daily routine feel consistent to pre-COVID will probably be very helpful for them. All right, let's talk about COVID vaccination, inflammatory bowel disease, and whether or not a third vaccine. So let's first talk about the primary series as we sit here today. Um, Pfizer is approved 12 and up, Moderna 18 and up, J&J &J 18 and up. Um, and everyone should get at least that two dose regimen. It's recommended in pediatrics. It's gonna be the mRNA vaccine. Um, and again, Pfizer 12 and up and Moderna 18 and up. Um, if there's been an allergic reaction or an immediate reaction to one of these um, um, vaccines, the other one should not be given. Um, so if you're getting your primary series and had a reaction to vaccine number one, you're done. Um, what about the third dose? So last month on September 2nd, the CDC and the FDA issued guidance about the, a second jab. This of course would be for the mRNA vaccines, the Pfizer or the Moderna since J&J, &J, at least right now is still only one 
dose, although the second dose of JJ is about to be approved as well. So the guidance is that if a individual is severely immunocompromised, um, and I'll go over the definition of that in a moment, then they should receive a third dose. I will say that the word severely is, is interesting here because this is not necessarily medically accurate, um, but it is policy accurate. Meaning if you are on any of these medications, I would not necessarily consider you severely immunocompromised, but for the sake of COVID vaccination, you're compromised enough that a third dose makes sense. So for adults, that's a prednisone dose of over 20 milligrams a day. And when we translate that into pediatrics, that's 0.2 milligrams per kilogram per day. If you're on any of these medications, the corticosteroids at that dose, uh, methotrexate, any thiopurine, uh, meaning 6MP or azathioprine, um, Zelgans, Azonimod, which is a recently approved medication for ulcerative colitis. If you're on a biologic, such as an anti-TNF agent, um, an anti-cytokine agent, such as Stellara, or an anti-integrin, such as Intibio, any of these medications, you meet criteria by the FDA CDC guidance for a third vaccine. I will point out that probably all of us are going to be in line for a third vaccine. So this is just staging. This is healthcare policy. These are the patients and the individuals they want to get the third vaccine out to first. But it's only a matter of time, I believe, that, that all adults will be recommended to get a third vaccine and then probably all pediatric patients as well because as time goes on, all of us lose antibody response. And the concern was just those on these medications may lose it sooner, although I will show you some data that suggests maybe that's not the case. Um, if you're on just mesalamine or a locally acting steroid such as Entecort or Eucerus brand name, generic budesonide, you do not meet the criteria for a third dose yet. But as I said, we all will be getting there. Um, when should you get your third dose? So the guidance is at least 28 days after the second dose. Um, and um, you can do this at any local pharmacy. You do not need a letter from your doctor. You do not need any sort of documentation. You probably will have to fill out an attestation that says you meet the criteria, meaning you are on one of these medications. But it is an attestation. You do not need to bring proof. And for now, whatever you got as a first uh, series, the first two, that should be your third. So if you got Pfizer, stay with Pfizer. If you got Moderna, stay with Moderna. Of course, for pediatrics, it would only be Pfizer between 12 and 17. There are studies being done now to see if mix and match works. Um, can I get Moderna and they get Pfizer as my third, or can I get two Pfizer's and get Moderna as my third? Very interesting scientific question is being studied. We will have that answer soon, but right now you stay with what you got. Um, it probably makes sense to think of this as a third vaccine rather than a booster. To say booster suggests that you lost the immunity and now we want to give it back to you. To say it's a third vaccine is exactly that. It's a third vaccine. And it's not so clear that you totally lose your immunity after the two. We just want to make sure you're protected and that's why you're third. And in fact, there is um, good evidence that those um, folk who meet this criteria, who are on these agents that I outlined for you, St corticosteroids, um, thiopurines, methotrexates, or a biologic, you don't lose antibody the same as been seen in those on chemotherapy or those who've received organ transplant, which is yet more proof that I wouldn't consider you to be quote unquote severely immunocompromised, just immunocompromised enough to be head of the line for a third dose. Um, there actually was a recent study that looked at pediatric patients um, who uh, received vaccine versus those who actually got COVID. And lo and behold, those who were vaccinated had a more um, enduring and higher level antibody response than those who actually got the COVID vac uh, the COVID illness itself. So vaccination works in those with pediatric IBD on immunosuppressive therapy, and it seems to work quite well. As I mentioned before, it's likely we're all going to get a third dose. Um, our children who are on these therapies are just head of the line. 
uh, I have here listed some very helpful um, resources for you. These are all available on the Crohn's and Colitis website um, and the different pages that you can find there. And on the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation website, there is a page specifically about COVID-19, which covers a lot of the information I have covered in, in this video as well. And, and feel free to refer to it. It is updated uh, much more regularly than shown here from March 2020. It's actually updated very regularly. So I thank you for your attention and hope you found this information helpful for you and your family.